Welcome to the Garden Talk Podcast, where we interview growers from all over the world, both beginners and experts, seeking to learn more about what they know about gardening and how they do things in their garden. What's up, everybody? If you that don't know me, my name is Chris, aka Mr. Grow It, and you're tuned into the Garden Talk Podcast. This is episode number 115. In this episode, I interview Jordan River. He has been gardening for 14 years and is the host of the Growcast podcast. He has a lot of experience of pheno hunting in different areas, and he's currently doing a pheno hunt in Hawaii. We get deep into pheno hunting in this episode, everything from the basic terminology, how he does his pheno hunts, his current hunt in Hawaii, and other ways to go about pheno hunting. If you want to see highlights of these podcast episodes, search Garden Talk Clips on YouTube. That channel is dedicated to short clips of these episodes. I also have a gardening channel where I have over 130 videos showing the plants that I've grown. I'll link that channel down in the YouTube description section below. And lastly, one of my goals for this podcast is to bring free information about gardening to the general public. That being said, I'd like to thank the sponsors of today's episode who helped make that goal possible. Thanks to AC Infinity for sponsoring this episode. My entire ventilation system is AC Infinity. I have their inline fan, ducting, carbon filter, and their controller. I love the Controller 69 Pro with temperature, humidity, and VPD programming, and having control of different fan speeds. This makes it so much easier to control my grow environment. Their Controller 69 Pro version also controls their oscillating fans, grow lights, and humidifier. The discount code MrGrowIt15 works on both Amazon and their website, acinfinity.com. Stash Blend. I've been using Stash Blend for over a year now, and it's awesome. One of the things that I really like is that it saves me money. It's a whole bunch of different inputs in one. So I no longer have to go out there and buy a silica bottle, then a separate seaweed bottle, beneficial bacteria, then a separate one for mycorrhizal fungi. All of that plus more is in this one blend. Go to stashblend.com to learn more about it. And I also have a link down in the YouTube description section below. And we are back. Welcome to the Garden Talk podcast. Today I am joined with Jordan River. How are you doing today? Hey, how's it going, Mr. Grow? How's it going, everybody? Doing good, man. Thanks for asking. You look uh, you look relaxed out there in Hawaii. That's where you are, right? Oh man, it's uh, it's beautiful. I know the rest. I don't want to make the rest of the country jealous. It's been hit with a snowstorm, but uh, yeah, I'm out here in Molokai, Hawaii, the desert island, and life is good, man. We're doing a pheno hunt out here. We're relaxing in the sun, and uh, yeah, I'm very relaxed, my friend. It's it's good. Life is good. That's awesome. Yeah, you were on the podcast once before, episode 101, which no longer exists. So uh, we actually had to take that down due to a third-party complaint. We won't get into the details on that one, but uh, I think there was like ten or 15,000 listens or views before it got taken down. A lot of good information there. Talked all about like living soil, and it was really, really good. But this episode, we're going to kind of switch it up a little bit. Like you mentioned, you're in Hawaii, pheno hunting. I think it's great to have a whole episode around pheno hunting and kind of what you're doing out there. So uh, I'm excited for this one. Since the other episode got taken down, we're really on a blank slate here. Let's do an introduction. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into gardening? That's right. I'm a wanted man. They're coming after my content, folks. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) Thanks for having me on, man. I really appreciate it. Your show is awesome. Uh, I just love educating people. For those who are tuning in for the first time, my name is Jordan River. I host Growcast Podcast. We are a cultivation education podcast. You can find us everywhere, Spotify, all those places. Tune into the show. I'm sure you'll love it. But for me, uh, it started as a medicinal journey. When I was a teenager, I suffered from uh, grand mal seizures. So I started to get into medicinal plants as a teenager um, and using them, but not cultivating them. You know what I mean? So it was actually kind of an up and down ride with my health and with my epilepsy. Um, probably because of the availability of the products back then. I wasn't growing my own medicine at the time. But uh, I got really into the medicinal side. I ended up moving to Humboldt County at age 20 and started growing. I'll uh, never forget. I don't know if I've even told this story before on my podcast, but it all started when I was walking down the streets of Chicago. I'm from the Chicagoland area. And we went into the city for uh, a night out, me and my sister and my parents. And I was walking down the street talking to my sister about how you know, Time Magazine had just come out with the big uh, front page with the leaf on it. And I said, I want to go to Humboldt County and cultivate professionally. And my dad heard me. And he goes, you know, your Uncle Jackie lives out in the Emerald Triangle and this and that. And he connects me with Uncle Jackie, connects me with Cousin Benny. These are all like family members um, who have sometimes been on the show. And they put me in touch with the boys in Humboldt. And it was just from there, it was 
it was all fate, man. I ended up moving to Humboldt County, um, finding Wolfman, my co-host. Uh, he was working at Bayside Garden Supply. So we got together. Um, I spent five years there providing medicine for patients, which was some of the best years of my life. And then at 24, 25, I started recording with Wolfman. We turned on the microphones. We said, hey, man, every time we get together, we can't not talk about gardening. So we might as well just turn on the microphones and broadcast this to the people. So that's how it started. Um, and now I do Growcast as a full-time thing. Our mission is overgrow. The idea of overgrow is simple. If everybody who wanted to grow did grow, we would all have enough fresh vegetables and fresh medicine available for everybody. Um, so that's what we're doing. You can come along, like I said, tune into the show. Right now we're doing a big pheno hunt here on the islands. Actually, it's a pretty small pheno hunt. Um, but it's, it's going to be a lot of fun. So come and follow along and, uh, we'll see how this goes. We'll see if I don't fall flat on my face here in the islands. That's awesome. And as usual, I will have a link to the guest in the description section below. So Jordan, I'll have you a link to your channel down in the description section below on YouTube. And then if you're on one of the podcast platforms, just listening, just search Growcast. It'll come up there in the search and then you'll be able to tune into his content. Fino hunting, man, let's get into it. Let's step it back for the beginners though first, because I have quite a few beginners here. They might not know what a phenotype is. They might not know what a genotype is. Can you break down those two things for us? What is a phenotype? What is a genotype? Sure, absolutely. So I like to compare it to humans. It's really easy to understand. When two parents have a child, that child is uniquely its own individual. And that child inherits many of the traits from their parents, right? Oh, you got blue eyes, just like your dad inherited that trait. The genotype is the actual genetic coding and the traits that got inherited from the parents. So that's like the hard-coded data. Genotype is in the DNA. It, is, it, it are traits that are present or not present that determine how the plant is going to express. For instance, able to produce anthocyanin, that purple, purple pigment that many plants produce, or not able to, to produce anthocyanin. If the plant is not able to produce anthocyanin, there's nothing you can do to coax that expression out of it. That's the genotype. It's the actual genetic information that was inherited from the parent plants. Now, phenotype is how that plant expresses. It's how it turns out, because there's a lot of variability in there. Phenotype includes environment. It includes you. How are you fertigating? What's your nutrient schedule? What's your environment like uh, as far as the climate? This all plays into phenotype expression, and that is why your phenotype is uniquely your phenotype. You may have seen before that someone will get the same plant. They'll get a cutting of a plant and grow it, and it turns out different than their buddy. Maybe their buddy even grew it in a very similar indoor controlled environment, but it just came out different. Funny how that came out different, right? Well, those are the phenotype. Those are the phenotypical differences, right? Those are the phenotypes expressing themselves. So, genetics also change over time. This is something that's really important to to understand, especially when you're dealing with medicinal plants, um, because environment does affect your genes, right? The way epigenetics work is that genetics affect our outcomes, and our actions affect our genetics. If you smoke a pack a day, and your kid smokes a pack a day, and their kid smokes a pack a day of cigarettes. Their progeny is going to have different predispositions than if you had not taken those actions, right? That's why doctors want to know if you have a family history of this or that. Same thing happens with plants. Genetics will alter the DNA over time. Viruses and viroids will, will get into the genetic code and change the way they express. And when it comes to plants, what we're really talking about is not so much smoking a pack a day, but the terroir. The terroir, this idea of the totality of the plant's habitat affecting how the plant expresses itself, the dirt, you know, the way that the soil and the microbes in the soil affect that plant's flavor, the salt air, something, something about it, right? That's the terroir. And terroir influences and changes genetics over time. I'll give you an example. I'm out here in Hawaii, and I was talking to some OGs about Maui Wowie. And when it comes to provenance, you know, a lot of people have different stories. And uh, when it comes to Maui Waui, they're saying this is a Oaxacan plant. This is a Mexican plant that was brought to Hawaii and acclimated over several decades. It changed the way it expresses, and now it's a different, uh, a different variety than we're used to. So again, it's about the genotype, which is the hard-coded inherited traits. It's about the phenotype, which includes that environment, 
And that environment really is terroir, which will alter your, your uh, genetic expressions over time. So it's pretty interesting stuff. That's a good beginner-friendly way to explain it. And I'm glad you broke it down like that because, again, we have so many beginners that are tuning into this. They don't know what phenotype is, what genotype is. So I think that's an easily digestible way of explaining it. So thanks for breaking that down to begin. Now, pheno hunting is a little bit different, right? That's what you're doing right now. What is pheno hunting and why would you do it? Oh, I love it, man. Um, and you know what, Mr. Groet, speaking to the beginners is what it's all about, man. That's what it's all about. If you can't convey your information to a beginner, your information isn't very valuable. I don't care how much stuff you've got up here, right? So for you to, to cater to beginners and to get more people growing, that's what overgrow is all about. So I love the idea of like, what is pheno hunting? How would you explain it to somebody? I want to start with a story, uh, a story about a conversation I had with a non-grower friend. And he said, Jordan, you care for these plants so much. You, you, you know, name them and, and coddle them and talk to them and grow them up perfectly healthy. And then at the end of their life cycle, you kill them. You chop them down. So you burn them sometimes. He said, do you ever feel bad about that? I thought it was a really funny and interesting question. And I was like, yeah, you do care for this plant. And then eventually it's going to end up, you know, being thrown in the fire, so to speak. And I said, no, I don't feel bad about that. Unequivocally, the answer is no. And the reason why is something called the botany of desire. This is a concept that plants want to please us. Plants want to fulfill our desires. And it's beneficial for them as a species. So let me explain. Plants have been on this planet much longer than humans have. Plants have been on this planet hundreds of millions of years. We're only a, couple, a handful, a thousand uh, as humans roaming this planet. So plants are very adept at surviving and proliferating and, and you know, spreading their species across the planet. And one of the ways they do this is they actually use animals and they use us as humans because if plants can express themselves in ways that are desirable to us, you look pretty, you smell good, you fulfill some sort of medicinal need that I, that I, you know, you, you ease an ailment in my body. These are all ways that plants please us. And what does that lead to? Well, it leads to us proliferating those plants, right? That's why you're sending your rare seeds to your buddy in Europe. And, you know, this plant is now spreading across the globe because it was able to please you. That's all plants like a lot of the ones that we grow. That's all they want to do is please our desires, fulfill our desires. And, you know, when we get into gardening, the first goal is to just keep our plants healthy, right? You want to, you want to see this plant to the end of its life cycle and, and make sure it doesn't die. But once we get adept, we reach the end game, which is basically hunting through these plants, becoming willing victims of the botany of desire, and finding the ones that please us the most, finding the ones that are most desirable. And then usually proliferating those, that is the cycle. That is the cycle. And if you think about it from that meta perspective, it's really trippy. It's really bizarre. I will probably toil for the rest of my life until I die looking through these seeds. I'm sure some of you could go through your seed collection and you couldn't get to all of them before you died. You're going to spend the rest of your life looking through these seeds, finding the ones that are most desirable for you, and then spreading them around. That's kind of the end game of this cultivation thing, man. Like I said, you get good at the actual practice, and then what? Well, you want to you wanna cross some of your own cultivars. You want to take those two pepper plants that are your favorite and, and bang them together and make new seeds and share them with your friends. Maybe even send them to another country. Like I said, what other organism is so smart to please us to the point where we send them across the globe? It's beautiful. So how many seeds do you need in order for a pheno hunt? I think that a lot of people think that you need to be actually growing hundreds and hundreds of plants in order to do a true pheno hunt, which is, just isn't true. In your opinion, how many seeds should you be kind of hunting through in order to try to find what you're looking for? This is a great question. It gets brought up all the time. And my view personally is a little more home grower empowering and small cultivator empowering. Um, 
you know, it's funny. It's like, how many do you need to constitute an actual pheno hunt? And there are answers in academia and there's, there are specific ones, but I broke it down. Really? What is the idea of hunting a phenotype? I mean, really anytime you pop a seed, you're hunting a phenotype. So I used to say like, okay, what constitutes a hunt, a hunt, maybe two, like all the way down to two. So you can compare them. Maybe even just one popping one seed should be considered a pheno hunt in my opinion. Um, but there are answers. Like I said, in academia, the number is 16, 16 seeds will give you a representation of this cultivar. And that has to do with math and Punnett squares, right? How they break down these different genetics. Basically, you can remember from, from biology class, they make these predictability squares that allow you to track genetic attributes and, and how often they pass down and how dominant they are. Um, and they all come in fours and four times four is 16. So academia says 16. I'm doing 30 because it's what I can fit. I say run what you can fit. As far as seeing what a plant is capable of, I like 100. I like 100. I think that that's a good way to see a lot of what the seed has to offer. Um, now, don't let anyone tell you that you're not a pheno hunter because you're not popping enough seeds. That is the only disempowering view that I stand against. It's like I think there's a lot of that being thrown around. You're a pollen chucker. You're not a breeder. You're just popping a seed. You're not a pheno hunter. I don't believe in any of that. I think if you're hunting genetic traits, you are a pheno hunter. So my view is very empowering in that regard. Not to get too far off track, but I do want to add, you, you brought up pollen chucking. A lot of people are against pollen chucking. You're, you think it's okay? You're, you're completely fine with that? I mean, listen, it's different. It's, it's, everybody has their own values and principles, right? But to me, if you breed something, you are a breeder. I don't, I, I know that there's a difference between just putting two things together and then actually doing like a full IBL. I understand that those are differences, but the word breeder to me means one who breeds. And I can't tell you some of the best genetics I've ever gotten were just a guy in his basement that had two strains that he liked and he put them together. And I'm like, this is an amazing cross. And he's going, yeah, but I'm not a real breeder. I hate to see that type of limiting belief. There's no difference between what you made in your garden than the guy who did a 100 plant pheno hunt. Yours is just a smaller selection. So I like to empower people. Breeding is easy. Breeding is easy and fun. And I think everyone should do it. So that's my, that's my view. It's interesting you say that. I did a podcast episode uh, several years ago now with Vader OG, Ocean Grown Genetics. And uh, I had mentioned to him, hey, I, you know, I did my first cross. I crossed, but... I don't really consider myself a breeder. You know, I just did this one cross and he's like, no, you're a breeder. You did a cross. You crossed a plant. You know, you took pollen of one plant, pollinated a female and made seeds. That's breeding. <laughs> so you're a breeder. And I'm like, well, okay. Exactly. All right. Ever since then, I like, totally it made agree. sense. And you just mirrored exactly what he had mentioned in that talk. So that's pretty cool to hear. Yeah, absolutely, man. And I completely agree. And I like to look at my principles and values as, okay, well, what's the result? If the result is telling people, hey, it is easy, showing people how to do it and saying you are a breeder, that means more medicine, more seeds. If you're there gatekeeping and putting people down and calling people names because they didn't do it the way you do it, that's just going to result in less people growing. That is the definition of gatekeeping, in my opinion. Um, and I don't, obviously, I don't condone people like releasing unstable genetics into the gene pool and not telling people, but that's not usually what's happening, man. Usually you've got really desirable cultivars being crossed to really desirable cultivars and a lot of fun stuff coming out of it. So that's what I like to see is as many people doing it as possible. Well said. So back to pheno hunting. Are you pheno hunting male plants, female plants, or both? Um, this is a great question. I, I have a few goals with this pheno hunt. The first is to just find plants that do well on Molokai. There's a lot of environmental pressures here. And so I want a plant that'll survive here, first and foremost. From there, I hope to find something really special. Sorry, we've got some heavy winds. It's the, it's the nature of recording outside. I hope to find something really special. Um, I would take a male. I would take a female. And, and the idea is to get it back to our head breeder, Rizo Rich, right? Um, he's been working on some incredible stuff. And I would love to see something uh, go back to him. But every pheno hunt is different. And I like to encourage people to base your pheno hunting and your gardening in general around a mission, around a mission or an idea or, or, you know, something that you can work towards. 
because if you have a goal, right? If you want to see a certain profile that you feel like is dead and resurrected, that's a beautiful mission. If you're looking for a certain plant that's going to help you with your medical issues and, and ease some of your ailments, that is a beautiful, beautiful mission. And that's going to determine just about everything. That's your guiding star, what, what you're aiming at. On the flip side of that coin is you kind of have to work with what you're given. So if I really, really want a good male, but I pop a bunch and there's just nothing that's that desirable, the last thing I want to do is select a subpar male because I wanted a male and then go forward with that project. I want to be wowed and impressed and spoken to. That's one of the only hard and fast recommendations and rules that I would say for a pheno hunter is don't kid yourself. You need to find plants that speak to you, that wow you, that knock your socks off. That's what you want to go forward with. And if it's not exactly what you were originally planning, sometimes you've got to call an audible. Sometimes you've got to change up the game plan. That's one of the reasons I really like the work that Rich does because he will never sacrifice quality and impressiveness to fulfill a goal. Um, but that being said, I do like to have goals in mind. And for this one, I want to find one that's going to do well in the wet season, that's going to uh, not succumb to powdery mildew and bud rot. I want to find one that's going to um, also do well for the rest of the year here and kind of go from there. And then if we can incorporate that in the work we're doing, that's just, wow, that's beautiful. So I, I have low expectations for this run. I'm just trying not to get my plants covered in powdery mildew and, uh, and budworms. So <laughs> that makes sense. So you really have to have like a clear mind on what you're looking for when you begin. It sounds like now you mentioned that uh, it's a little bit different there in Hawaii. I'm assuming you've done pheno hunts in other areas where you lived before. What is the big difference there? Do you have any tips for folks? Cause uh, really we got people from all over the world tuning in, right? Is there anything specific area wise that people need to know when they're doing a pheno hunt? Yeah, absolutely, man. I think this is why it's so important to pheno hunt, especially for outdoor growers, because you are, you are basically going to succumb to the environment to some degree, and you need to have plants that do well in that environment. It's not the same as growing in a tent. I've done little pheno hunts, popping packs of seeds in my 5x5 five five and things like that, or back when I was in Humboldt, popping seeds here or there. Um, but this is different because it's an outdoor in bed living soil grow now luckily i've connected with a guy he's a he's a guest on my show malachi kevin he's been doing it for 11 years out here so that's really beneficial because again the reason why you need to pheno hunt and find stuff that works in your environment is your environment is different than mine your environment is unique and there are lots of cultivars that aren't going to do well in certain conditions you got to look through the genetic gene pool and find what thrives in your locale. So here we have to deal with really specific stuff. Right now it's the wet season, so it's extremely humid. It's cool out, but it's, I mean, it's super wet. Like you don't even want to have mulch on your living soil beds wet. There's standing water, you know, it'll turn to soup if you, if there's a heavy rain and you water it and there's mulch. So, you know, we want cultivars that are mold resistant. We want cultivars that'll thrive well in high humidity that can deal with overwatering well. These are all really specific attributes that are basically just going to, you know, weed out the weak. The st only the strong will survive. But everybody's uh, environment is completely unique. Everybody's garden is unique. And that's why you need to be hunting for your space. Now, I will say one thing here. I think the word resistant probably gets thrown out a lot when you're talking about people working in their environments and breeding. They'll say, hey, I am in a humid environment. I ran a bunch of seeds. Five of them got powdery mildew. One did not. Therefore, this one is a mold-resistant cultivar. I would be pretty, I would be reticent to say something like that. But what I will say is it works well here. It resisted this species of mold. It, it survived and thrived during, during these stressors. Saying something is pest resistant or mildew resistant, I'm always a little bit hesitant. Too many times have I seen those claims then prove out to be you know, wrong in a different environment. But what is 100% true is you can find a cultivar that does well in your environment with your stressors and then keep that over time and, and keep it there and give it out to local growers, especially important with the outdoor growers. I'm now learning. <laughs> yeah, I've always wondered like when say, they say, oh, it's resistance to powdery mildew or resistance to pest. and I mean, how do you prove that? Couldn't anybody just say, oh, yeah, this is resistant to powdery mildew, right? Isn't there like, is there any testing that can be done to like prove that in the genetics it is resistant or, or no? So in coffee, I like to work in coffee. That's my other big medicinal plant. I mean, I love all plants. Don't get me wrong. 
But in coffee, they have to have st- strict guidelines to say something like that. You have to do a double blind controlled study with a with a you know coffee institute at Vanderbilt University or whatever. And and like I said, it's a control. They have these large scale grows, so so it's not just a small sample size. They have two of them, and one of them they will introduce the coffee borer beetle, or they will introduce coffee rust. And you have to get you have to get white papers published and peer reviewed on this stuff before you can go out there and say, hey, here's a mold resistant coffee cultivar. Okay, so that doesn't really exist in our world there on the medicinal side of things, right? Virtually non-existent. Nobody's doing that. So I, I do like to see people doing like smaller controlled studies of that. There are some people who do release some pests into their garden and document it. But generally, that's just not happening, you know, outside of big, big crops. And, and like I said, universities usually conducting a lot of these studies. Coffee University of Brazil, uh, again, Vanderbilt University, study uh, coffee science studies. Um, these are the places that like do those types of testing and will actually give you a white paper that says, congratulations, you have found a mold resistant cultivar doesn't really exist in other plants. That's really interesting. Okay. So you said you, uh, current phenohan is 30 seeds. You're outdoors in a living soil bed. What are you using for like organic inputs throughout the grow cycle? Yeah, this is an interesting one here on the islands and it's made me rethink about a lot of things really, but here we don't have access to a lot of stuff. I'm used to Amazon being my best friend. You know what I mean? ACinfinity.com, hit up rootedleaf.com. We're, we're rolling, okay? Amazon takes like three, four weeks to get anything here. You know, Walmart and Target is faster. Come on, Walmart Garden Center, let's go. Where's the AC Infinity tents? But, <laughs> uh, but Amazon takes a long time to get out here. So, so basically you have to use what you have around you. And that works well with all our style of growing. What's crazy, Mr. Grow It, is everybody on the island who grows, grows sustainably. Not just because the organic scene is big here, but because you have to. You have to. If you want nitrogen, the easiest way to get it is to make some fish aminos, right? The easiest way to get kelp is to go harvest kelp out of the ocean. Uh, Coco Quar is all over the island. It's, you, you throw those coconut husks right into a chipper and it comes out like fluffy gold like pillows of gold. It's really, really interesting how there's so much closed loop farming out of necessity here. And I'm going to be employing a lot of those practices on this run. Um, that being said, I did sneak some secret weapons here. I've got my rooted leaf. I've got some things that I, I know are going, to be, are going to be beneficial. But mostly, listen, I'm not looking to reinvent the wheel. I am, I'm going to the 11 plus year growers who have been doing it here and say, what do you do? You know, I say, let's interplant some basil in this bed. And they say, yeah, but that's going to attract spit bugs. And I go, what the H are spit bugs? <laughs> and they explained to me, there's this bug on the island. They love basil. You were just about to attract them into your garden and ruin everything. But you didn't know because you haven't been growing here. So I'm not looking to reinvent the wheel. I'm, I'm following these guys. Molokai is historically the grower island. Um, you can see... All the growers, when you fly in, if you fly in at a night flight, you'll see all the floodlights in the backyards, and, and that's to keep uh, their plants awake at night because the light cycles here are different. And uh, it has a rich history of growing here and specifically sustainable growing. So we've got a bio waste, a green waste remediated medium um, that uses cinder, local cinder, as the aeration. And, uh, you know, they make their own microbes here. They make BAM, beneficial anaerobic microbes. And we're just doing it local. That's sustainability, by the way. Just because you're a soil grower doesn't mean you shouldn't take a look at your sustainability and say, how can I close these loops? I've definitely been guilty of that before. And grow how you're going to grow. But if you want to grow sustainably, it's about closing that loop more than anything else. You know, I think that's a a good end goal there is to be able to do that. Definitely helps the environment, eco-friendly. Now, can you do a pheno hunt in multiple mediums, let's say? Could you do like a hydroponics, have some plants in hydroponics and some plants in living soil and then do a pheno hunt that way? Also, two-part question here. Is there any benefit to just doing a pheno hunt in hydroponics where you have that more precision control over the inputs? So when people ask about like how to grow during a pheno hunt, I always say grow the way that you know how to grow grow the way that you can grow them healthy and see their full potential expression. There's kind of, kind of two sides to that coin, which is you want to grow them well so you can see how well they express themselves. But you also want to see what they do when things aren't perfect. That can be very, very telling and beneficial. 
Um, so yes, there are benefits to growing in cocoa where, uh, I'm sorry, to growing in a hydro setup where you can really fine tune and test those things. If that's what you're looking to do, get data like that. That's one of the best ways you can do it. But I always say, do what works for you. Uh, whatever medium you're currently doing well in do that. There are some benefits to small pots, being able to move things around, remove things, overwater things easily, underwater things easily, keep everything in a separate container. So for instance, a root borne pathogen doesn't cause problems for everybody. There are definitely benefits to using small pot sizes. But the, the, the point of all this is you're basically just growing. If you know how to grow and you can grow well, do that. The only real difference is you're basically just looking for expressions. Most of the time, right? Like sometimes, yeah, we also need a yield because it's our personal medicine and, and everybody's going to be a little bit different. But mostly you just need these plants to be big enough to show them your structure. You just need them to flower enough to get their profiles. You don't need to carry necessarily these plants all the way through like you normally would. You just want to see what they do. Take notes, take clones, and then collect that data and use it. That's really the key. So whatever that looks like to you. Um, I wouldn't necessarily recommend, recommend switching setups. I would do what works, but yeah, there are benefits to certain styles of growings and specifically certain container sizes when pheno hunting helps keep the, keep the plant small, uh, be able to remove things and rearrange things so you can take close looks at things instead of, you know, the one in the back corner looks real good, but uh, I can't really get there. <laughs> so there are benefits, but do what works for you. Again, I'm all about recommending what works for your current setup. That's the best answer. Okay. And then as far as characteristics to look for, there are so many different things that you can look for, right? I mean, anything from trichome production to structure to color, it, it goes on and on and on effects, you know, after it's harvested and stuff like that. What characteristics do you look for? This is again, largely determined by your goals, obviously, but there's a whole list of, like you said, the obvious ones, scent, frost coverage, yield, structure. These are things that, uh, we all look for and admire and just kind of add up to things we like, right? Now, if you have a very specific mission, then you know what you're looking for. I just want that profile. I'm just going to hunt that profile. I may even put up with some weakness in order to get that profile. So it's, it's goal-driven. That being said, I do like to look for certain things. Ease of growth. Ease of growth, meaning largely to do with feeding. Even green leaves with whatever I'm feeding it, um, you know, maybe I stress it a little bit and it, and it doesn't miss a beat. Ease of growth is, is a big one and how a plant feeds. Um, I want tough cultivars. Again, I don't want to say resistant, but things that hold up to stressors. I'm going to make mistakes. Okay. Like we're going to have stressors. I don't need to introduce this or that. Like we're going to have problems. Trust me. So I like to see how they hold up against those problems and how well they do. Um, and then he, getting even more specific. I like to you know what I like to see on a plant? I don't care what I'm hunting for. I don't care if it's a certain profile or if I want a male or whatever. I want to see botanical compounds showing early. I want to see early frost. I want to see week two. Start to see things that you don't normally see until later in the cycle. That's one thing that's almost a sure giveaway. Um, a low leaf to flower ratio or leaf to fruit ratio. That's another big one where... If I'm going to be, if I'm going to have to manicure this thing after I harvest it, I want to be doing one or two clips. That's always super, super uh, attractive to me. And internodal spacing. Internodal spacing does not get enough play, I feel like. Um, getting the right distance between the nodes and then also ones that are resistant to those changing due to the environment. So maybe if you're a beginner grower, this will be a good tip for you. Hotter environments will increase your internodal spacing length. It stretches plants right colder temperatures cause plants to huddle up and stay bushy but there are certain cultivars i've noticed that kind of maintain their internodal spacing regardless that's always very attractive to me nice big towering plants that grow outwards in a nice canopy and a nice internodal spacing those are the very specific things that i love to see but largely it's going to depend on your goals and what you're looking for um it's just, you never can go wrong with a good structure and ease of growth and things like that. Those are probably my favorite traits to see and select for. How about the, uh, the old stem rub technique where you're rubbing the oh, stem yeah. on your fingers and then smelling it and then kind of comparing the smells. Do you do that at all? I'm a stem rubbing fool. 
<laughs> Mr. Grow It. I'm a stem sniffing MFer. Um, stem rubs are really interesting. I've actually given a lot of thought to this because we do our Q&A streams for the members and, and sometimes they ask really good questions like, I'm getting this profile off my stem rub. Can I expect it in flower? And, and like I said, I've done a lot of stem rub in my, in my day. I'm, not, I'm no scientist, but I've sniffed a lot of stems, okay? And I can unequivocally tell you that sniffing the stem and seeing that profile, I feel like less than 50% of the time, definitely. I feel like way less than 50% of the time, you actually smell that smell the whole way through until the finish. Usually it changes. Usually your stem rub is going to smell a little bit different than your flowers in week four. And usually your flowers in week four, I, I, w- I would say about half the time, maybe more, they change uh, until harvest. And then you cure it and it's a little bit different after that. So I don't think it's a great indicator of what profile the plant is going to give out. I certainly wouldn't ever like cull a plant because of early indicators like that. However, I also feel like super unscientific, super Jordan Rivers opinion. I also feel like it's a pretty good indication of loudness overall. So yes, the, the smell itself, the type of smell may change, but if I'm smelling a stinky, stinky stem in, in week three of veg, I feel like generally that translates to stinky, stinky flowers later in flower. Just, just the overall powerfulness of the scent, you know, the power of the scent. I feel like it's a pretty good indicator of that. Rarely do I see, oh, whoa, this stem stinks, and then it's just kind of flat terpenes in the end. That usually doesn't, doesn't track with me. Again, those are super unscientific observations, but I, yes, I love stem rubs. I love stem sniffing. I don't think it's a great indicator of the way the plant will smell as it matures, but I do think it's a pretty good indicator of if it's going to stink or not. I, does that make sense? I hope that makes sense. That does make sense. Yeah. I know some people are completely against it for kind of the reason you mentioned how like the profile changes throughout. So that's a, that's a really good call out there. Now you mentioned stressing the plant. You said you do stress, although it's kind of automatically done. Stress kind of happens throughout the grow, so you don't really need to do anything specific. But other people are doing precision stress techniques while field hunting. What type of those precision stress techniques can be done in order to try to hunt through phenos? Typically, I feel like there's two types of pheno hunts just classified in my brain, Jordan River categories. And I feel like the first one is coddling pheno hunts. And this is typically what I like to do, which is you try to keep your plant as healthy as possible. You want to have as few speed bumps as possible. And this will show you what your plant can do at its fullest potential, right? It'll, it'll show you what it's capable of if you grow it really, really well. And then the other side of that is what I like to call the hell run. And this is how a lot of people pheno hunt, which is like you're saying, I'm going to underwater this plant. I'm going to stress it. I want to see the ones that do well when things aren't going right. That's really, really beneficial too. Typically, I like to do one after another, ideally. And like I said, it it just happens if I run a plant. But ideally, I like to grow a plant to its fullest potential and see what it's capable of. See that I like it. See that it wows me. And then I can go back the second time and do some of those stressors. The easiest ones are to expose it to high heat, expose it to cold, um, see how it does under too little light, saturated with a lot of light. These are really, really easy things to test, overwatering, underwatering. It gets a little bit crazier when people actually introduce pests, insects, or a pathogen, or things like that. P- people who do that, I really do have respect for. And I want to say specifically, when I was talking about like testing and, and, and official testing, I don't want to put down the people who are doing small controls, because that's, that's the best we have. Those people are doing God's work. Sure, it's not to the level of, of like some university would, would be able to do it, but I love the people who do introduce pests to their small-scale grow and document the data. That is really, really cool and, and very good work. But two different types of pheno hunts, both are extremely beneficial, and, and both are necessary, I'd say, to really understand a cultivar, both seeing what it can do under the right conditions and then how it responds to you know, um, non-optimal conditions. Those are both very important, and those are the two types of pheno hunts. So that's what I'd say. How about training the plants? I know some folks who do pheno hunts, they say, grow the plant naturally. Let's see what the natural structure is, and then make the decision from there. Other folks do training 
on the plants. You know, the low stress train topping, any sort of high stress training techniques, whether it be, you know, like super cropping, for example, they do that. Now, I have a feeling I know what your answer is going to be is do what you want to do as a pheno hunter. It really depends on what route you want to go in regards to it. So you, as a pheno hunter, what do you do? Do you let your plants grow naturally or do you do some form of training? I like to do what I normally do in my garden, but also what I think most people do. I'd like to turn this around on you, Mr. Growett. Do you think most people top their plants as a form of training? I think a lot of people do. I think a lot of new folks don't because they don't want to mess with it. They don't. They just want to grow the plant and let's see how it is right off the bat. But I think as they're a grower or two in, they will because they can see what the benefits are. They can you know learn how to do it, see what the benefits are. Some people need to control height in their grow space, so they'll top. Some, uh, some people do it in order to kind of help with the training, make the plant wider, have those lower branches kind of grow out and make a wider plant. So yes, for the most part, I feel like new growers probably just let the plant grow naturally. Other folks, I, I think a majority of people do do some form of training, whether it be topping, super cropping, or low stress training. I totally agree. I think the majority are those who, are, like you said, are new and aren't training or those who are training. And I would say of those who are, Topping is probably the most common. Maybe people can let me know in, in chat. Uh, shout out to the, to the Fimmers out there. You know, make your voices heard uh, in the comments. But I feel like topping is pretty common. And I feel like it is a good idea to do at least one high stress training event during your pheno hunt. Again, everybody grows different. Do what you're going to do. If you're a low stress training master and you want to bend her over and do all the tying up and fun stuff, you do that. You do you, buddy. But I like to see one or two high-stress training events because sometimes plants don't respond super, super well to that. And it's good to know if your cultivar is one of those plants. Other ones, I feel like you top them and they just like, they take it as a personal challenge. <laughs> and the next day, they're just exploding with growth. That's another trait that I love to see, responds well to topping. And again, I think that's beneficial because I, I would say that most plant trainers top. Again, you, you, your audience is going to have to correct me if I'm wrong on that, but I feel like most plant trainers top, and that's what I love to do. It's so simple to teach someone. Go in there, snip here, look at the nodes, do it right at the top, multiply the branches. I like a good topping, man. Simple, quick, effective. Uh, but it all depends. I know, some, I know some people, shout out to Monster Scrog and TK Geico. He's a member. I know some people that Fim and Scrog, a masterpiece plant. So I could never advise against that. But I do like to see high stress training, like a topping during a run. Just see what the plant does when you cut it. Okay. Fair enough. Now, as you're growing these plants, some folks will be killing off plants as they go through the grow, right? They may see something in the seedling stage, as early as the seedling stage. Maybe they see funky growth to begin. They're not going to keep that. So they kill it off. Or in the vegetation stage, maybe they're seeing something that they don't like with the morphology of the plant. So they're killing it off. Are you the type that kills off plants throughout the grow? Or are you a pheno hunter where you're letting everything grow, no matter what it looks like, all the way up until harvest? Yeah, absolutely. I tend to cull early and often. I think if you're looking for a plant that checks all the boxes, you have to cull early and often. Like I said before, if your mission dictates that you look through some of these finickier seeds, then so be it. Maybe you're after that elusive you know, lime smell uh, or something. You may tolerate weakness to see this plant through to see if it's the one you're looking for. But for me, I think that people generally are too slow to cull. I think that there's so many seeds out there, you guys. There's so many good genetics. There's so many wonderful types of plants you can grow. And if this thing is, if this thing is giving you any trouble, my recommendation would be to cull earlier, cull more often, and send more. We have a lot to look through. And um, like I said, I think people are generally a little too afraid to cull too early. If you're looking for a plant that checks all the boxes, you should be culling basically from beginning to end. On the flip side of that, you really can't tell how a plant is going to express until it's all the way done. One of my members asked me a, a, a new type question that's like such a good question, which is, how can you tell when a plant's like final profile is there? What, at what stage can you tell what a plant's final profile? I said, harvest? Cure? Four weeks into cure, maybe? Um, you have to keep it around to really see what it's going to do. But if, again, if you're looking for something that's going to be the one and it's going to check all the boxes, start culling early and start culling often. The only exception to that is if you're looking for a specific medicinal effect or a specific profile that you're willing to put up with some finickiness to get there. That would be my answer. 
Okay. And then at what point do you select a keeper pheno? Do you select just one or have there ever been a time where you had to select multiple keepers because you just, you liked more than one? Oh man, always, always. So I think there's like a few ways to do this. Some people find a strain that works for them and they have their keeper and then they start working it. They'll, they'll, they'll find their cultivar and they'll make more seeds. They'll work the generations further. They'll do stuff like that. Um, other people keep kind of a stable. I'm one of those people. I think this is probably the most common uh, when it comes to cultivators and home cultivators where they, they get a list of keepers and they keep a handful around. And then what'll happen is sometimes a new one will pop up that's better than one in your stable and you'll kind of swap that out. So for me, 2023, I had a handful of keepers, man. Um, some Rise of Rich work that was incredible. Some Purple Caper work that was really, really good. Another that a member made. Um, a peach dosi by a guy named Old Bay. Uh, there's just some really, really good keepers, and that's kind of created my stable. Once you're at that stage, I really recommend you share the love and spread cuttings around. You want to either make seeds or spread cuttings around because the last thing you want to do is hunt for years and years and years and find your unicorn and find the one that that helps you. You know, helps your crones or helps your migraines. And this is the one. And then it dies in your garden and it's gone forever. You cannot let that happen. That is like the only scenario that's like a failure in this whole botany of desire pheno hunt thing. And the way that you remedy that is by backing up those genetics. The easiest way is to just give it to your buddies. There are like uh, tissue culture ways to like store stuff. That's really cool. But the easiest way to do it is just pass the cuts around and share the love. Share the love. See if it helps other people with your same ailment. We're all biologically different. Maybe you got the real panacea cut. We don't want to lose that to a power outage. We don't want to lose that to a soil-borne pathogen. So spread that love. Um, but yeah, for me, it's like I keep a stable of keepers. Some people keep no cuts and they just want to look through as many seeds as they can and, and paw through the library and see as much as possible. I think that's a beautiful mission in itself. But for me, I'm hunting for something so I can keep it. I'm going to keep a handful of things because I like variety and I'm going to spread those cuttings around so I don't lose them. You know, there's several Gromies who are holding on to those cuts. So I don't got to worry when I'm out here in the islands that I'm going to lose all that hard work. So that's what I recommend is do that hunt, get your keeper, get your stable, and then spread the love. Give those cuttings out. It'll be the smartest thing you'd, you will ever have done when uh, something goes wrong in your garden. Trust me. Yeah. Losing Fina, the, the, the feeling of heartbreak. That happens once you lose that pheno that you just love so much. And I spent so many years just popping seeds, growing plants out, finding really good ones, and then not like monster cropping. Like the, at least you can bring it back, right? So it, even if the plant's in the flowering stage, shows into flowering, you can cut off a limb and put it right into soil and it'll root again, right? And you can keep those genetics around. I made the mistake of not keeping a handful of of good phenos uh, around what was and it i, I hear, I hear it. a personal story here man tell me tell me the top regret i gotta hear it queen anne's revenge by tga genetics well formerly it was tga genetics back when i grew it then i went to Subcool seeds i think miss jill took it over mm -hmm. i had a beautiful plan i talk about it so much on my channel that uh people are probably sick of hearing the story behind it but uh, <laughs> but it was just just beautiful plant easy feeder it had covered in trichomes from top to bottom the lower buds were super dense it was like no larf on it whatsoever towards the end of flowering the purpling that happened it was like a dark dark purple that started at the top slowly worked its way down the plant as the days went on and then i ended up doing a partial harvest on it so like i harvested the top branches and it uncovered some of the other leaves which weren't exposed to the light and they were like a, so like a green color and the purple with the green, it kind of looked like more like a neon green. It just looked amazing. And then uh, lastly, the effects. The effects on that were just incredible narcotic effect. I ended up picking up a 10-pack uh, a of Queens and in Revenge six months ago. And I grew out some more plants just because I'm, I'm looking for that Fido again. I circled back around. I haven't found Did it yet. Find anything close? No, uh, oh. not yet. Not yet. So I'm going to keep, keep hunting for it because... Uh, I need oh, to find man. that. <laughs> I need to find it. It's it's there's so many heartbreaking stories like that. And like you said, it's it's uh it's surprising how much of a reaction you'll have. Like it's a really sad event. It's like that thing's gone forever. It, it bums you out, like you said. I had a Katura Kush by Cultivated Choice that was just straight coffee beans. Just face full of coffee beans and I love coffee. 
and that's probably one of my biggest you know sad moments is losing that one but but shout out, shout out Queen Anne, shout out that the old school NorCal boys, sub cool, RIP. That's cool, man. That's really cool that, that you found that cultivar and it was so amazing. Yeah, so hopefully I can find it again. And uh, yeah, again, Monster Crop. I actually found a uh, Icarus Wings by Prism Labs, beautiful plant. And I had it in flowering and I'm like, I need to keep this one. I had more seeds, but like, I want this one. So I went ahead and Monster Cropped it. And so I'm keeping that around and I'll probably use it for a breeding project because I'm just so excited about it. You got to, man. Anyways, back on topic. Uh, we're coming up towards the end here. I do want to ask you if you have any other tips on how to conduct a successful and efficient pheno hunt. Yeah, absolutely. Um, don't be afraid. Get started. Get started now. Don't let anyone put you down or tell you you can't do it or that you're not a breeder, you're not this or you're not that. That's the first most important thing. Um, and then what you just said, basically, stay organized and stay on top of things and take notes. You should have cuttings of everything you're hunting. Uh, even if it means taking and re-vegging something, you're going you're gonna to try one five weeks into cure and go, holy crap, I should have taken that cut. That's the last thing you want to do. So take cuttings of everything, back up everything, share everything, and most importantly, take notes. Data is so important. Your brain will trick you. Your brain will let nostalgia and emotions come into it. So find out what works for you, whether that's doing it electronically so you can go through and control F and search through things and scroll, 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 or doing it old school. Get the, the whiteboard up on the grow room wall so you can take all of your extensive notes and then maybe snap a picture of it before you start over. Old school, you know, pen and paper. Find what works for you and take extensive notes. That's really the only big difference between doing a grow and doing a pheno hunt is just popping a lot of something or a lot of different things, taking notes on everything and taking cuttings so you can run them again later. It's basically the same thing. Um, so that, that is my advice. Do it for yourself. Your own palate makes you unique. There's no one else with your tastes. That is why your selections are going to be unique. Um, so yeah, just don't let anyone put down you or, the, or your work or what you plan on accomplishing. Get a mission in mind. And, and head towards it. And remember that at the end of the day, we're all just willing victims of the botany of desire, growing these plants, proliferating these plants, doing their bidding, essentially, so that maybe they can please us with a new pretty color or a fascinating new aroma. So I'm here for it. I know you're here for it. And uh, start pheno, pheno hunting today. That's my last tip is just start. You got so many seeds. I know you've got seeds piled up, listener. So pop them, pop 10 of them, pop 100 of them. And God bless. Good luck. Great advice. Very well said. All right, let's wrap things up. Tell the listeners how they can find you. And is there anything upcoming in the future that you want to talk about? Absolutely, man. Um, Growcast Podcast. Just tune into the podcast. We're on Spotify. We're at growcastpodcast.com. All the apps, everything. Just listen to the show. That's, all, that's my only real big call to action. Um, we do have Growcast Seed Co. If you want to take a look at the amazing genetics by Rizo Rich. Uh, we got the Cookie Truffle Shuffle, Shuffle up there. Is doing amazing. Is doing amazing in this sun. Uh, we do have some chill out OG just uh, over there off camera uh, as well. So we're rooting for that, that one. <laughs> we are rooting for this chill out OG in this race, but we'll see what ends up happening. So growcastpodcast.com. There you'll get the episodes. You'll get the seeds. You'll get everything. And then as far as events, we got a Cultivators Cup in Rockford, Illinois, April 13th. Just go ahead and message me. It's kind of invite only, but you can message me uh, growcast on Instagram or the website growcastpodcast.com. That's April 13th in Rockford, Illinois. We've got a Pestapalooza with Sink Angel, Matthew Gates, coming up in Virginia. And we've got a Rhizo Rich Breeder Class in Buffalo and Toronto. That'll all be later this year. Follow Growcast to stay tuned. Awesome. I forgot you had those Chill Out OGs. Yeah, if you end up growing them out there, I, I'm really interested to see what you get for a result. Because we're in a completely different climate. Like, I'm in the desert, you know what I mean? It's very dry here. And, I mean, I'm growing indoors and I'm controlling my environment and stuff like that. But different genetics can react differently right different morphology different expression in different areas so somebody could grow it and they could be like this is hot trash in one area other area they're like this is fire you know what i mean so i'm interested to hear how it how it works out for you in your area it's it's the opposite environment and malachi kevin said that ogs do okay out here ogs when i used to grow sfv it was a little bit finicky but it never got powdery mildew and he said they do okay out here so we'll be rooting for the chill out og to be a front runner in the pheno hunt Awesome. Definitely keep me updated on that. So for the folks listening in, if you have any questions on pheno hunting, please drop it down in the comments section below. 
I have other people who have talked about phenol hunting on this podcast. If you dig back on some of the episodes, you'll see. But there's definitely different opinions, different ways to go about it. So if you are interested in learning other ways to go about it, definitely tune into those other episodes. And if you do leave those questions in the comment section, I could potentially use them for future episodes because I might have missed something. Might have been something that somebody's listening in and like, oh, why didn't he ask this? Put that down in the comments. And uh, next time around when I have somebody talking about phenol hunting, I'll ask that question for sure. And thanks to all the Patreon folks that are supporting this podcast through Patreon. Patreon.com slash Mr. Grow It. Got tons of supporters over there that directly supports the continuation of this podcast. 100% of the funds go back into this podcast. So thank you to all who support me over there. Jordan, this has been awesome. This is really, really good talk. I enjoyed the first one. I enjoyed this one. Good luck over there in Hawaii. Hopefully we can link up soon again, do another episode because uh, definitely dropping knowledge bombs out here, giving a lot of value. So thank you so much once again. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Grow It. You have an awesome platform, an awesome community, an awesome show. And uh, yeah, we can do another show, but you're going to have to come out to Molokai, bro. You're going to have to come out to see the Fino Hunt live in person. <laughs> that would be awesome. <laughs> I'm down, dude. Just kidding. I'm down. I'm kidding. <laughs> it's a desert island. Listen, if you're down, we can talk about it. But it's, uh, it's, it's a little wild out here. So I'm going to go. I appreciate you having me on the show. And uh, anything you need, Mr. Grow It, hit us up. Sounds good. All right. Peace out, everyone. Catch you in the next episode.